Hey everybody, it's so good to have you with us today. And if this is your first time joining us and you're new to Grace Honolulu, we especially wanna welcome you. You know, around here we like to say that everyone's welcome because nobody's perfect, but with God, anything's possible. This is a place where you can encounter a real God who can change your life. Now, last week we uh, took the week to pray and fast. And I must admit on Friday night, it was really good to eat, but I was so encouraged to hear stories from many of you on what God did in your life and through your life this week. So if you missed it and didn't get the resources, I wanna invite you, you can still participate and go and get our free devotional guide on our website so that you can get up to speed as to what we participated in last week. Now, as our team makes plans for us to regather at our new property, we're busy cleaning, landscaping, and getting things ready. So we wanna make sure to keep you involved in everything that we're doing. So if you haven't already and you don't receive our emails, text, connect to the number on your screen. That'll be our way to be able to reach out to you and let you know what's going on in the coming weeks. So at this time, our worship team is gonna lead us in declaring how great and awesome our mighty God is. So will you join me and put away the distractions and focus your hearts and worship. Welcome Grace Honolulu. So glad you could join us this Sunday. And uh, we hope you enjoyed your week of uh, fasting and praying. Hope it was very fruitful. Um, I like one of the lessons where it compared God to duct tape, where, you know, duct tape is very reliable, is very tried and true in a, pin in a pinch, and, and so is God. And, you know, by coincidence, we are going to be singing, Your Love Never Fails. It's talking about how God's love never fails us. It's ever, it's never changing. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to worship, and let's go for it.
Father, we thank you for your love, Lord. There is nothing greater than your love. We thank you for sending us Jesus, who is our amazing Father, our amazing Shepherd. And we just thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our lives. Amen. Aloha, everyone. And I pray and I hope that this past week of prayer and fasting has been a time for you to draw closer to God and to deepen your relationship with Him. You know, as I was trying to avoid the kitchen and the smells of foods and things, I would go outside this past week and start taking care of our garden, which has been severely neglected and completely overrun. And as I was sitting there going through and digging all of those crazy nut weeds out of our lawn, and God really began to speak to me about how my lawn was kind of a representation of my heart and of my mind and my soul and how we let these weeds grow in our garden and didn't take care of it right away. And then over time, 
And they just started to grow and to spread and to pretty much cover our entire lawn. And it reminded me of my heart and how when I let little things like a little worry or anxiety or a little bit of irritation or impatience take root in my heart and I don't take care of it, then it will start to spread into all the other areas of my life. And so this year, now that we've started off to a great start with spending time with God, I want to encourage you to continue that, to spend time in His Word, to spend time talking with Him, to spend time singing songs of praise to Him. Because that's how we go through and we weed all of the things that are not of God out of our hearts, out of our minds, and out of our souls. And another good thing that we can do to ensure that we have a relationship with God that is strong and that is close is being generous with our time, with our talents, and with our treasure. So I want to encourage you to continue to be generous in this new year, to continue to give, to help others, to show God's love and kindness wherever you go. If you'd like to join me in giving right now, you can text GRACE808 to the number on your screen and you'll get instructions on how to do that. Let's pray together, family. Father, we thank you for this amazing time that we have, Lord, to worship you together as a church family, to be able to stand united and to let our collective lights shine brightly for you in our community. We ask, Lord, that you would equip us with what we need in this year, Lord, to be able to be your hands and feet in this community and to show your love and kindness to everyone that we meet. Amen. Hey, Grace Honolulu family, this week we went around our new home looking for places where the monitors are going to go and our sound system. We had some technicians trying to figure out the different wire and we are getting ready for us to be able to gather here. I can't wait for you to be able to be together with us here. Uh, This week we're also coming out of a week of prayer and fasting and it was a great week of prayer and fasting. Uh, One of the interesting moments that I had was a, a moment of prayer where I was just intensely seeking God for breakthrough for some personal issues, family issues, and some for issues that are in our country, in our world. And as I was loudly praying, I felt like the Lord said, shh. You ever been shushed by the Lord? I felt like the Lord said, just be quiet, be still. And I I really didn't understand what he wanted me to get out of the moment at first, but as I did just be quiet and be still, I heard the sound of birds chirping. I heard my dog rustling around. I heard our cat eating its food. I heard the coffee maker go on and the sound of that coffee dripping. That's always a good sound. And the aroma of coffee began to fill the place where I was sitting. I heard some of the people in our house begin to rustle around. In fact, it was so quiet. And at one point, I got so focused in this, I actually began to hear my own breath. And I was reminded of all the little things that the Lord does and get buried in the midst of all the noise of our life. I mean, he's the sustainer of life. He's the giver of the breath that we take. And I was reminded that God is working always. When we see it and when we can't see it, God is at work and he's blessing us with our goodness that we receive. And so in this moment, it was just a really great moment where I remembered that God, you're at work in the midst of all the noise that we hear going on. In fact, right now we're we're living in a pretty noisy time, right? We're living in the noise of a pandemic. We're living in the noise of a lot of political division and there was violence a couple weeks ago. We're living in the, the noise of racial tensions as well. We're living in the noise of economic turmoil. And in the midst of it, church, I wanna, I wanna remind you and I wanna encourage you in this. God is at work. He's at work when we see it. He's at work when we don't see it. God is always at work towards his will and for his purpose. And the beauty is he invites us into that. And so I want to invite you to come together with me and run together into the purposes of God as we go into an inauguration week. And there's a lot of noise around this inauguration week. There's a lot of concern about what's going to happen, potential violence that's going to happen. Um, And I'm praying for it. And I want to invite you to do what God says to do. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, God says, Trust me that I'm at work in the midst of everything. And in your moment of need, turn to me. And so he says, come to me in this place. And when you come to me, humble yourself and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. And if you do that, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive your sin and I will heal your land. 
This is the confidence that we have. In the world, we know there's going to be turmoil. There's going to be things outside of our control. But we serve Jesus, Jesus who overcame the world, Jesus who overcame the turmoil, Jesus who is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And so I want to invite you to come together with me and let's pray. Let's pray this week for God's will to be done. In the midst of all the noise that's happening, in the midst of all the turmoil, we believe that God is working. So we're praying for our God who conquered all those things to deliver peace in this moment. And I'm praying that your heart would not be troubled. So together we pray, Father, we thank you. Lord, that in this world, you said we would have tribulation, but God, you have overcome the world. So Lord, we take courage, we take heart, and we will not allow ourselves to be troubled. Instead, we will do what you said. You said, if my people who are called by my name, if they come to me and they humble themselves and they pray, if they seek my face and they turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Lord, we ask you to forgive our land. We pray for peace this next week. And we pray for protection over your good earth. We thank you that we can look to you for this. Because you're a God who sees us. You're always at work for your good purpose and your goodwill. In Jesus' name, amen, church. Amen. Keep praying together with me this week. Enjoy the rest of our message and our service today. God bless. Hey, Grace Honolulu family, we are in the middle of an amazing series called Awesome God. And we are loving the series because we're learning about our awesome God. Now, as we begin today, let me ask you this question. How many have ever felt invisible? How many of you have just felt unseen? Yeah, many of us, right? In fact, all of us at one time or another have felt like this. And we have different moments in our lives that reinforce that we're unseen or that we're invisible. In middle school, high school, I love sports. I, my favorite was wrestling. That's what I gravitated towards. And I dreaded those days when we were going to play basketball. I'll tell you why. You know how the drill goes. Two guys are chosen as captains. Then teams are picked. And they begin to go, I want him. I'll take him. In other words, I see you. I see you. And in my heart, I'm hoping, please see me, see me, because you don't want to be the last one picked, the unseen guy. So I'm hoping and I'm hoping. So typically what happens is all the guys with skill and all the guys with height, they get picked. And I had neither of those things. So I'm hoping, pick me, pick me. And most of the time, unfortunately, I was overlooked, unseen, and I was the guy who felt completely invisible in that moment. And that's just kind of a silly, small moment, but it reinforced the feeling that many of us have, that some of us have at different times. And the reason why we feel that way is because you and I, we have a legitimate desire to be loved, to be, lo to be valued, and to be seen by other people. Man, I am reminded of this every time I walk into my house. I have this little dog, her name is Ellie, and every time I come into the house, or we come into the house, she will not just bark, but she will howl, and she will not stop howling until somebody acknowledges her and until somebody scratches her belly. Literally, she will chase us around howling and throwing herself in front of us, just kind of, again, demonstrating the desire that all of us have is to be seen and to be loved. And we may not howl physically like the dog, but on the inside, many of us are howling to be seen and to be loved. And it may be just because of COVID that this thing is ramped up. I feel like many people now feel unseen because of COVID. But it's not just COVID. It's not just socially distance, uh, distancing, as important as that is. It's the housewife or the mother who feels completely underappreciated in her service, and she sit, feels unseen. It's the guy who goes to work and puts in long hours and feels like he's never acknowledged for it. And then he goes home and he wonders, man, does what I do or do I really matter? Right? It's the people who've been passed over in their jobs and they feel overlooked and they feel rejected and unappreciated and unseen. Or, or for some of us, it's those carrying the guilt of shame, the shame because of a habit or an addiction or a hidden sin. And we've convinced ourselves that we're unwanted, that we're unseen. And I'm seeing a lot of people who just feel misunderstood. Have you ever felt misunderstood? And when we feel misunderstood, the question that comes into our mind is, man, does anybody really understand me. I feel so misunderstood and misunderstood, not known. Does anybody really know who I am? And many people right now, they're carrying illnesses. And when you carry an illness, there's just little thought that causes us to think, you know what, nobody really understands what I'm going through. Those are some of the reasons why we just feel unseen and unloved and uncared for. But how is it that we just get to a place in our society where there are certain people 
that we just don't see, certain people in our society. Now, one of the first things we teach our kids, if you've got kids, you know this, when you go out into public and you see somebody who maybe has a physical infirmity or a physical uh, incapacitation, or maybe somebody with a mental illness, out of respect for them, we teach our children not to stare. We say, don't stare. But as we grow up, don't stare turns into don't see. And we end up after a while with this tendency of overlooking people who have problems or issues or are in any way different than we are. And we play as if we don't see what we actually do see. In this respect, I think of the many homeless people who live here in Hawaii, the precious people who were created in the image of God, who have their own stories. And oftentimes, we don't look at them, we don't see them anymore because we've changed from don't stare to don't see, and we overlook those who are different and people that we consider problems or people that we consider those who have issues. At times, honestly, I think it is just more convenient for us to see people as different from us, as other, as invisible, because not seeing them absolves us from the responsibility of actually caring for them. Look, the worst kind of blindness that you and I experience is when we stop seeing and understanding each other. And the worst kind of invisible happens when we begin to objectify people or even groups of people and we're not really seeing them as individuals, as, as precious people created in the image of God. And right now in our country, I think both those dynamics are going on right now. Right now in our country, we're stopping to see other people for who they really are. And we've been blinded and we're seeing people as invisible because seeing them gives us the opportunity in our hearts to feel good about not caring for them. And so we have this tension, this tension that we're talking about today is the fact that people can become invisible to us and we can become invisible to people. And it's, it's not just like we've been talking about uh, the ones that we don't know and unfortunately they become taken for granted by us and when we take them for granted we begin to no longer see them. It's often the ones that are very close to us. It's often those that are in our workplaces. Some of us are living in a workplace situation where the people in your workplace are not seeing you anymore. Some of us are living in homes now where you're married to somebody who's not seeing you, or you have children, or you have parents who are not seeing you, who don't see us anymore. So I want to look in Genesis chapter 16 today as we look at how God cares for this guy named Abraham and his family. In fact, from 12, Genesis 12 to Genesis 15, it's all about Abraham and his family because they are important characters in the story of God. I mean, he is the one who defines our faith. He's called the father of our faith. Without Abram, Abram, Abraham, there is no Isaac, there is no Jacob, there are no 12 tribes of Israel. There is no nation of Israel. And ultimately, without Abram, Abraham, there is no Jesus birthed into our earth. So it makes sense that God would spend so much time talking about him and his family because he is one of the visible ones. He's one of the important characters in the scriptures. So we hear about how God loves him and cares for him and brings him into his promise and how God ultimately guides and blesses him. But here in chapter 16, the story takes a turn to show us something about the nature and the character of God. This is super important, especially if you feel like you've been either marginalized or forgotten or you're unseen or unwanted or like you're not a major player in the story of God. Or, or maybe today you don't even feel like you're in the story of God yet. This story is for you. This story is for me. This is for all of us who at times feel like we are invisible, unseen. God takes this detour to show us how he responds to and how he relates to people who are on the margins and oftentimes forgotten and unseen and undervalued. So let's read together in Genesis chapter 16. It's a good story. Now Sarai, the wife, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. She said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. So go sleep with my slave, perhaps we can, I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah had said. So after Abram had been living in the land of Canaan for 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her slave, her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. Now, right there, that is crazy, right? We're wondering what's going on. Well, here's what's going on in a nutshell. God had promised 
Abram, who will later be known as Abraham, that he would become a father of a multitude of nations, that his descendants will be as great as the, star, as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, that God would use him to, to rescue the world and to accomplish his plan of blessing the world. And it was going to happen through his family. Now, there's a big problem. Abram, Abraham does not have any children. And he's about 75 years old when God first makes that promise to him. And Sarai is 65 years old. And she doesn't want to be the one because now this is 10 years later. Now Abram is 85 and Sarai is 75. And she doesn't want to be the one who hinders or interrupts God's purpose and God's fulfillment of his promise to her husband. So she comes up with this idea where she takes control. And in her impatience, and you know, honestly, in both of their lack of trust that God was able to fulfill the promise that he had made, she says, I can't have children, it seems, but maybe if you sleep with my servant, my slave, we can have a family through her, and that child will be our family, and that way we can fulfill the promise of God. And so, you know, even though, and again, this sounds crazy, especially in our world, in our society, because this ain't the way that things are done. But in their culture, in their world, it was acceptable. Which, just spoiler alert, just because something is culturally acceptable does not mean that it's going to go well. In fact, can you tell this situation is going to go real bad? And it does go real bad. And here's what happens. When she, when Hagar knew that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slaves in your arms, and now that she knows that she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. And then Abram tells her, your slave is in your hands. You do to her whatever you think best. And then Sarai mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was a spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? And she replies, I'm running away from my mistress Sarai. And then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. Can you, can you imagine that? Then the angel added, and I will increase your descendants so that they may become too numerous to count. And the angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son and you shall name him Ishmael. And that name Ishmael means he hears for the Lord has heard your misery. And she gave him the name, she gave this name to the Lord. Think about this now. She's just overwhelmed that God has seen her in her situation. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. She said, For I have now seen the one who sees me. And that is why the well was called Bir Lahai Royi which means the well of the living one who sees me. And it is still there between Kadesh and bread. So Hagar gets caught in the crosshairs of the promise of God and the impatience of Abraham and Sarah and this plan that they have. And then she adds to it her own turmoil by just being contemptuous and despising her, her master Sarah. Uh, which is kind of understandable, but then she becomes arrogant as she begins to become pregnant while her, her mistress is barren. So can you imagine now at this point, Sarai is retaliating. She's jealous and she's furious. I mean, could you imagine being in this household? There is so much contention and jealousy happening in this moment. On the one hand, you have Hagar, who is just despising her master and giving her these ugly, hateful stares, mixed with a little bit of arrogance because she's going to have a baby and Sarai is not. And then on the other hand, her master is using angry words and he's, she's mistreating her. We, we don't even know if that's physical or just verbal, but there are harsh words, angry, jealous stares that are coming forth. And I believe the birth of stink eye in this moment as these two engage with each other in this way. And Sarai can't take it anymore. And scripture says that Sarai mistreats Hagar. And so Hagar can't take it anymore and she flees. She fled from her. Sarai mistreats her to the point where, uh, again, we don't know if it's just verbal or if it's maybe physical, but in any case, it gets so bad that she has to get away and she runs away. 
You, you know, this scripture highlights something that I think is true about all of us. Sometimes it's not what we're running to, it's what we're running from. Sometimes it's not what you're running to, it's what you're running from. And in this moment, Hagar, she is running from Sarah. She is trying to get as far away from her as she can. She is running from her painful reality. This is her situation. It is painful. She is running from the trouble that she didn't start, but she contributed to in a big way. And now she's running. When the angel comes and says, you know, where did you come from and where are you going? Her response is, I'm running away from my mistress. And over the years, I've, I've heard stories of people that are are running away from things. Maybe you've run away from something. I've heard people, uh, a neglected wife who says, I'm running away, or maybe this is why she's, she's leaving the marriage, because she's running away from what she considers to be a lifeless marriage. Or I've heard people say, I'm running away from the pressures of a job as the guy takes another drink from his six-pack, maybe his second six-pack. Or I'm running away from a cold-hearted woman that I'm married to as the guy justifies looking at more porn. Or I'm running away from ungrateful children as she pops open her second bottle of wine and it's only like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Or, or for many people, I'm just running away from the daily grind. I'm running away from all the expectations. I'm running away from all the pressures. And in this season in particular, I'm running away from loneliness. And so I know I shouldn't engage in this relationship and it's not going to go well, but I'm running and I'm running away. And at points in time, we're all running away. And as this slave woman lay alone, obviously unwanted, uncared for, and feeling unseen in the desert, God finds her. This is what Genesis 16, 7 says. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near the spring in the desert. Because it doesn't matter where you've run to, and it doesn't matter how far you've run. I mean, you can run to a new job, you can run to a new city or a new state, or even to a new country, or you can run to a different marriage, or even a different church, or you can run deep into sin, and it doesn't matter how deep you've run into sin, or how you have run so far from the call of God, like I did. It doesn't matter. You can't go anywhere where God is can't find you. And that's not a threat. That's good news to know. Psalm 139 verse 7 says it like this. David realizes, he recognizes all the different places he's been. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? And he talks about all the different places. If I go high, you're there. If I go low, you're there. If I'm in trouble, you're there. If I'm good, you're there. If I'm in darkness, you are light for me. God finds us because he loves us. I was running away from the call of God. I Ran so far, I went to a college campus hoping just to get away from the tug of God's Spirit in my life. And God found me. I didn't find God, but God found me. Now, the question I think of when I'm reading this is, why would God find somebody like Hagar? I mean, we understand why he would find somebody like Moses, who became the deliverer of the people of Israel. We understand why he'd find somebody like Joseph, who saved his entire family and eventually the race of Israelites. And we understand why God would find somebody like David, this young man who conquered the giant Goliath, who became the king of Israel and a Christ-like representative to the nation of Israel. We understand that. We understand why he'd find a woman named Esther who ended up saving her people. But Hagar, I mean, she's a slave. She is literally on the margins. And at this point, she's unwanted. She's uncared for. She's been pushed away. She's running away. She's forgotten. She's unseen. But the angel of the Lord comes to her and tells her, go back. Go back to your mistress and submit to her. God wants her to go back to the scary thing that she was running from. And he wants her to face it. Your situation is what God wants you to go back to. It's going to be what it's going to be. It's going to be difficult. First, for Hagar, when she goes back, it's going to be a difficult situation. It's going to be what it's going to be. She's going to be what she's going to be in the situation. But you and I, we cannot spend the rest of our lives running from everything that is uncomfortable. Some of us, we got a hard job and we didn't know what to do. And so we ran away from it. And we gave up on it. For some of us, it was our marriage. We had some marital conflict. We didn't know what to do. And so we're running away from that marriage. For others of us, it's just a situation and things got tough and things got difficult. and We've been misunderstood and so we run away from it. For others of us, it might be a responsibility that just got too heavy for us to carry and we couldn't hold it anymore. So we just dropped it. 
Maybe for some of you right now, especially in this season, your business has really been challenged and you don't know what to do anymore. And instead of facing it head on, you're running away from it. I, I think this is going to help you, and I feel like this is the message right here. This is the message to Hagar and a message to us. You and I, the best thing we can do is stop running. Stop running. Trust God and face our situation no matter what it is because there's nothing for us in the desert. There's nothing for us in the desert. If we keep running, you'll never discover your purpose. If you keep running, you'll never discover who you are in God. If you keep running, you'll never discover the person who God created you and intends for you to be. And so God meets this woman in the desert and he gives her life a purpose in the midst of of her troubles. And then he gives her a promise. And he says to her, you're going to have a son and your son will be the heir of an incredible heritage of people. And there will be a huge lineage that comes. And the angel added, he says, the angel added, I will increase your descendants so much so that they will be too numerous to count. And to this woman in these troubles, he gives a brand new purpose. And he says, you will give birth to a son. This sounds so much like the proclamation that was made to little Mary in, in the book of Isaiah 714. It says, you will give birth to a son and you shall name him Ishmael. He hears, for the Lord has heard your misery. Look, Hagar, she's not a major player in the story. She is an unseen one. She is a forgotten one. In fact, she is a cast out one. She's somebody who's been verbally abused and sexually used. And she's running away from her situation in this moment. And God finds her and she's, am she's amazed. She's amazed to hear that God hears her and that God sees her in her misery. And so in this moment, there's incredible hope and there's incredible renewal of joy because she realizes he cares about me. He cares about my condition. He actually knows what I'm going through. And he speaks to her and he gives her a purpose in the midst of her misery. And this highlights something about who God is. God seems to prefer to use people for his redemptive purposes who others overlook. In fact, if you look at the family tree of Jesus, it is filled with people that our culture, and even in their world, they would overlook. It's, it's, it's odd, actually. Sarai, who was called the, the mother of a multitude of nations, she was actually barren, but God chooses her. Tamar, who is in the lineage of Jesus, is a widow who played a prostitute. I mean, the story is so weird, I can't get into it. Rahab was a prostitute. She was a Canaanite woman and a prostitute. Ruth was a Moabite who were the enemies of the Israel. Bathsheba, there's so much scandal. She was an, an adulteress, not only an adulteress, but she was with a man who eventually ended up killing her husband and making her a widow and then marrying her. Again, the story is, is amazing. It's crazy. And what about Mary? Mary, the teenage girl who was found to be with the child before she was married. God, it seems, loves to use people that others have overlooked, that others have discarded, that others have unwanted, that others have dismissed for his redemptive purposes. And that's what he's doing in this moment. He's bringing Hagar into his story, and he's giving her a purpose in the midst of her trouble and in the midst of her misery, which tells me that God brings redemption in the midst of our suffering. God brings his purpose and he gives Hagar a brand new purpose and he promises to bless her life. And Hagar responds to this encounter by just worshiping God. She's so humbled by this and she gives him the name that expresses how this moment is changing her life. And this is what she says as she calls on the Lord in this moment. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. She said, you are the God who sees me. And in Hebrew, it is, you are El Rohi, the God who sees. But she adds me. You are the God who sees not just what's happening, but you see me. I mean, can you imagine how amazed she was when she realized the creator of the universe saw her? He said, I see you. Abram might not see you. And Sarai doesn't want to see you anymore. But I see you. And I know you, and I care about you and your situation, and I am going to give you a purpose. I am at work giving you a purpose in the midst of your troubles and in the midst of your misery. Sarah, you have my attention. God doesn't just see the superstars of faith. 
He sees us. He sees us in our struggles. He sees us in our challenges. He sees us when we're weak. He sees us when we fail. He sees us when we make huge mistakes. He sees us when we've counted ourselves out or others have counted us out. He sees us. He sees you. God sees us when no one else sees us. He sees you in your pain. He sees you in your pain. He sees you in your suffering. He sees your suffering. He sees us when no one understands our sorrow. He sees us. He sees what we're going through. And God wants you to know today, I believe, that he sees you. I see you. I see you when you feel alone, when you are alone, when everybody else has counted you out. But I, I see you. I see you when you don't have a, a title or you don't have prestigious position. I see you. I see you when a lot of people are hating on you. I see you. I see you when you've made huge mistakes. I see you. I see you when your situation is not good. I see you. I see you because I know that others have counted you out and I know that in many ways you've counted yourself out. I see you when you're forgotten and when you're rejected and when nobody else takes notice of you. But I am El Rohi. I see you. You have the attention of the creator of the universe. He sees you. He sees what you need. He sees where you're going. And he knows how to get you into his purpose, where he wants you to be. You have his attention. He sees you. He knows you. He cares for you. And at, he is at work in your life, giving your life purpose, even in the midst, and especially in the midst of trouble. He is El Royi. In fact, some of you, you just need to write that name down. You need to post it somewhere where you will see it every morning and be reminded that God sees me. He is El Royi. God, you see me. You see me. And you need to tell the devil sometime, devil, you can't do whatever you want to do to my life because El Royi, he sees me. I can't, devil enemy, you can't do whatever you want to my health, to my body because El Royi. I'm not going to have a negative end because El Roy E. Others may have counted me out. The enemy may have counted me out. He may be counting you out right now. He may be telling you this as far as you'll ever go. This is as much as you'll ever become. You'll never be able to be more than you are or do more than you've done. And you deserve this situation that you're in. And you just need to stand up straight. You need to tell the enemy, no way, because El Roy E. He sees you. God sees you. He knows you. He cares about you. And he is at work in your life, giving you purpose, even in and especially in the midst of your troubles. He sees you, right? He sees you. He sees right where you are. He knows what's going on in your life. He knows what you're going through. He knows what's happening. God sees you, and that's really all that matters. He's got a plan for your life. I know some of you, you go to bed with tears on your pillow at night as you worry about your family or your children or your marriage or whatever situation, and you're tossing and you're turning at night, you need to know God sees you. You're up at 2 a.m. in the morning pacing the floor as you think and consider your future and the things that you're in right now. El Royi, he sees you. He hears every desperate prayer. He sees your desperate prayers, moms and dads, as you pray for your children. He sees you in the midst of that. He sees you not wanting to go back to your work, not wanting to go back into that environment because it's so uncomfortable, it's so difficult, and you feel so unwanted there. But he sees you in that. He sees you, especially if you've been mistreated or abused, and you feel like you're worthless, and you don't even feel like anybody sees you. But you're wrong. God sees you. And if God sees you, you're wondering, well, then, if he sees me, how could he let this happen to me? And even though he didn't cause what happened to you, he saw what happened to you. And even though what happened to you was bad, you're not bad. And God, who sees and knows and he cares and is at work in your life, is able to bring good out of your life despite the bad things that have happened in your life because he is El Roy. He's the God who knows and he sees and he cares and he's at work and he's bringing his purpose into your life for your good. When you're hopeless and you need to remember El Roy, remember this, he is the God of compassion. He sees those whom the world has forgotten. He sees those whom the world has undervalued. He sees us. He knows us. He cares about us. He is at work in our lives, and he is giving purpose to the troubled moments that we find ourselves in. 
I, I love this because this story is from the Old Testament, but the God who sees us continues to move into the New Testament. And this is what we read about Jesus. And Jesus continues to see us, and when he sees us, he has compassion for us, which means he doesn't just have empathy, which means an understanding of our pain. He doesn't just have sympathy, which means he has an identification with our pain. He has compassion, which means that pain drives him to actually do something about it. And it says in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Watch this. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. And the reason why we fix our eyes on Jesus is because he had his eyes fixed on something. The author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross. I mean, did you, did you hear that? For the joy set before him, for this vision of fulfilling the purpose of God, which was to save you and I, he endured the cross. He despised the shame, but now he has accomplished the will of God, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Because God sees you, you can run with confidence. Instead, you can run with confidence to God instead of running away from your troubles. We fix our eyes on him who is fixing his eyes on us. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who the joy, which is you, as he saw you and what was going to happen, you would be forgiven and restored into a right relationship with God that empowered him to continue doing what he did. And so we fix our eyes on him because God sees us. You and I can run to God with confidence instead of running away from your troubles. He sees you. He knows you. He cares about you. He's at work in your life in the midst of troubles, giving purpose to it. So we don't stop running to him. We don't stop going back to him. And we don't stop going back to face our troubles with confidence, knowing that he sees. So here's what we do. We fix our eyes on Jesus. We run to God through the word of God. I want to encourage you as we begin a brand new year. This is your opportunity to fix your eyes on Jesus and to run to God by going to his word, by reading his word. We face the uncomfortable things in our life. Instead of running away from them, knowing that God sees us, gives us the courage to be able to run to face those things. And then we allow God to align our lives with his purpose, especially in the midst of troubles. How do we do that? How do we align our lives with God's purpose? Two big things. Number one, we learn to obey him as Hagar did in the small things, in sometimes the difficult things. When she was told to go back and submit her life to her mistress, she obeyed God. And we learn to submit our lives to God and to go back in obedience and do what he's called us to do. And the second thing we can do is we run with God to share his love and his compassion, the compassion that we've received, knowing that God sees us with other people. I mean, this story gives us this pattern of compassion, how God relates to those who are on the margins, those who are overlooked, those who are forgotten, those who are unseen. This story shows us how God relates, and he wants us to do the same thing with those people who are unseen, outside of the story of God. We may not see them, but he sees them and he wants us to see them. And because God sees you, you can run with God to demonstrate the truth that we are seen by God who loves us. He is El Royi. Gang, I want to invite you to run to God with me through prayer. That's what we're going to do, knowing that he sees us, knowing that he knows you, knowing that he cares about you, knowing that he has work in your life. He's giving purpose even to the troubled moments. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you see everything. Lord, you, you see our lives from top to bottom, all the details, Lord, and you alone are able to fix the situations that are out of order. So Lord, we ask you to help us keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, who had his eyes focused on the heavenly Father and on us, who for the joy set before him, you endured the cross so that we could be forgiven and brought back into a right relationship with our heavenly Father. 
And God, we ask you to work through us to demonstrate, Lord, to a world that oftentimes wonders, does God even see what's going on? Lord, give us the courage, I pray, to reach out to those who may not know that you see them and that you love them. Lord, give us the courage to reach out to people and to help them run back to our Heavenly Father. We thank you for that in Jesus' powerful name. God sees you. God sees us. Maybe you're hearing this for the first time or coming to understand it in a different way. And I want to invite you to run together with all of us to God. If you've never run to God, maybe you're running from a situation or maybe you've just been like me many years ago. I was running from God. I was trying to hide out from the call of God and from the love of God. And looking back, I don't know why. Why was I doing that? Why would I resist the love of God? Why would I resist the call of God? Why would I resist doing what I was created to do? It didn't make sense. It doesn't make sense now, but it made sense to me at the time. I want to invite you to run to God. Run to God, the God who ran on our behalf a race by fixing his eyes on the purpose of the Father and on you. He knew that in his death, and his resurrection. He would provide for you and I the forgiveness of our sins. Christ Jesus came and lived the life that we should have lived. And then he died on a cross in our place to pay for our sins. But he didn't stay dead. He was raised from the dead by the power of God, demonstrating that he is the Lord, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, that he is and always has been El Royi, the God who sees you. He knows you. He cares about you. He's at work. He loves you and he's calling you into his purpose. And I want to invite you to take this first step into his purpose by praying this simple prayer of relationship with God. Pray with me together. And church, pray. let's pray together as those who are praying for the first time pray this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for giving your life on a cross to pay the price for my sins. I thank you, God, that you raised Jesus from the dead. I believe that. And so I ask you, God, to forgive me of my sins today, all of them. Wash me clean. Make me brand new. Lord, where I've been unseen, I thank you, God, that I've never really been unseen. Your eyes have seen me. And you've seen this moment where I would come back running to you. So, Lord, I pray that you would forgive me and that you would also fill me with your spirit so now I can run with you into my purpose and into my call. I thank you, God, for brand new life. Lord, help me to be one of those people who live with compassion and share the love of Jesus with other people and let them know that God sees them. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Woo! If you just said that prayer for the first time, you just entered into relationship with the God who sees you, he knows you, he cares about you, and he is at work in your life, giving purpose to your life, even in the midst of troubles and problems. That's the God that you've just entered into relationship with. Man, we are so excited for you. And we wanna help you take next steps in discovering your purpose and how to walk in relationship with God in your purpose. And to get some more information, free information from us, you can text the word new start to the number on the screen. Man, it's a big day for you. We're so excited. We want to invite you to worship with us. Let's celebrate together El Royi, the God who sees us, the God who knows us, the God who cares about us, and the God who is at work in your life. No matter what your circumstances or how unseen or forgotten you may feel, God sees you. We celebrate him.
Yes, there is nothing greater than the love of God, and there's nothing greater than knowing that the eyes of your Heavenly Father are on your life. I know, I know my kids, whenever they do something spectacular, they want to know, is mom and dad watching them? And you need to know that your Heavenly Father sees the moments that you celebrate, and He sees the moments that you're all alone and you're the only one celebrating. And you thought you celebrated alone, but you didn't. Your Heavenly Father sees it all. Have a great week. Live in that confidence knowing that your Heavenly Father sees you, that He knows, that He loves you. He is working in your life. And let's walk together with God to help other people run to the God who sees them, who knows them, who cares for them, and who's at work in their lives, bringing them into his purpose. God bless. We'll talk next week as we continue to discover our amazing, amazing, and awesome God.